Hello and welcome to our webinar, Meet the Artist, Penguin's premier picture book creators. I'm Maggie Reagan, Senior Editor for the Books for You section at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along any other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to today's slides and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download these materials at any time by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. Today, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from James Yang, author and illustrator of A Boy Named Isamu, Gabby D'Alessandro, illustrator of The Cot in the Living Room, Lauren Long, illustrator of Someone Builds the Dream, and Karina Lucan, author and illustrator of The Tree and Me. We'll begin with a brief presentation from each panelist and we'll then move into our Q&A. First up is James Yang. James Yang's prize-winning work has appeared in many magazines and newspapers, including Graphis, Newsweek, Forbes, Fortune, and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He is the author illustrator of Stop Bot, Bus Stop, Joey and Jet, Joey and Jet in Space, and Puzzle Head. The designer of Clockman, a sculpture on display at the National Museum of American History, Mr. Yang and his wife live in New York City. James, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to go a little bit around. First of all, thank you very much to the ALA. I'm glad uh, to, to do this with you guys. And um, thank you so much last year for uh, for the Geisel Award too. Um, it really helped me a lot to really think of myself as a bookmaker. So that's been the biggest reward. With a boy named Asano, I'm going to start actually a couple of years ago. I was uh, doing a project uh, for Golf Digest. Condé Nast asked me to go to the Masters, which is a very famous golf tournament, to uh, do illustrations and write a humorous story about it because they'd re read my Twitter feed and asked me to write a story. So I'm walking the course and one of the editors <clears throat> of Golf Digest just asked me what it's like to be a children's book illustrator. And I said, you know what? I'm a little bit freaked out right now because I have one book that I've just told him and I said, and I told him it was gonna be great, but I'm a little bit freaked because I haven't done it yet. And he goes, well, tell me, what's it about? And I go, it's about Isamu Noguchi. And the thing that's really intriguing is that he's half Japanese, half American, uh, born around 1909 during the Japanese American war. Can you imagine a worse time to be born? And when he was a child, he never felt like he felt in as in, when he was in the US with the other kids. And then he did go to Japan when he was younger and felt like he didn't fit in there. And I said, this is a story. So I said that I had this idea for a story where he just travels, connects with art, because he actually was um, a very lonely child. He was also a child that would spend a lot of time in solitude and even mentions how nature kind of helped him become the artist that he was. So then when I told my uh, editor about this, it, he actually got a little bit teary-eyed. And the story that I wrote for Golf Digest actually mentions this little anecdote. So if you ever want to read it, just type in James Yang masters tournament and that story will pop up and you can read about it real briefly but this story basically is my imaginary story about Isama Noguchi he's someone who I've, as an artist I've always admired visually I I even use a lot of similar shapes and the fact that his childhood does resonate because I was a only Korean child who grew up not, I mean our family was the only family in a small town in Oklahoma. So there's a lot of similarities being like the only one in a different place. And there's a lot of similar connections. And also I used to go wander off a lot with my on my bike, maybe to the lake and just sort of wonder about the bigger world. So here's the cover. And it's inspired by, a, by um, there's a biography of Isama where he talks about uh, listening to the stone. So that kind of was sort of the hook that I had. Uh, for the cover. Next. Next. 
and you can see the inside page here. Uh, for those of you who are you know, Gucci fans, I really did try to, I have a specific style that as you, as most of you know, if you have seen my work before, and I'm always trying to sort of find my way to interpret certain things. So this is sort of, what if uh, Noguchi was sort of seen through my eyes? So I was really trying to catch a aesthetic feeling with him. And it's really about, this book really isn't about, it, it's more about solitude. It's about exploring on your own. So of course, I do feel like a lot of Asian American kids growing up would connect to this kind of story, but anyone who always, who felt like they didn't fit in or maybe felt like the oddball out or not even an oddball, even anybody who uh, likes to be alone or really appreciates those quiet times. I, I'm hoping this is a universal enough story to connect with people. So I just wanted to give you a brief taste of this story uh, next. I started this one out, uh, if you're a boy named Tom, and, and I use second, I think this will come up later, but I use second person because I thought it's a nice way to place the reader into the position. So uh, it's not exact, this, this images are not historically accurate per se, but they try to catch a certain, era of time, and I try to sort of moderate it up a little bit to the next slide. And then you can just sort of imagine as, if you're a Samu that you, you start looking for quieter places. Next. And then a lot of what I try to do with the writing was I did read a bunch of quotes from Noguchi and just try to catch some of the sensibility of how he may have seen things, because he talks a lot of times about, he even mentions that if you lose your sense of childhood as an artist, um, then you've really lost your sense as an, as an artist. Next slide. And this is the page that really resonates with me because I used to do a lot of walking quietly in the woods too. And I, and, you know, this is, I could imagine Noguchi as a child seeing maybe, you know, when, when you look at things as a child, maybe later an artist, you're sort of trying to reorder the world in a, in a world that's more, uh, is a friendlier world for you. Next slide. This is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite pages from the book. You can see a little bit of the imagination, both as the reader and perhaps from uh, Isama's point of view. Next slide. And then as, sure, as a kid, I'm sure we all had secret places to hide. So you, I think this is my last slide and I hope that this gives you a sense of the journey that my character takes through the book. And uh, thank you for listening and looking forward to your questions. Oh, here we go, one more page. <laughs> and uh, there we go. Thank you so much, James. Next up, we have Gabby D'Alessandro. Gabby D'Alessandro is a Dominican illustrator illustrator based in Brooklyn. She attended Alto de Havon in the Dominican Republic and moved to New York to complete her degree in illustration at Parsons School of Design. Her work has appeared in many publications and her clients include the New York Times, the Library of Congress, the Bot Botanical Garden of Padua, and New York City's MTA. Take it away, Gabby. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, so happy to be here and thank you all for joining us. I'm gonna be talking about The Cut in Living Room, which is my first picture book. Um, this book is about a young girl living in Washington Heights whose parents help neighbors who work overnight shifts by inviting their children to sleep in a little cot that they've set up in their living room as these parents work. Um, it's narrated from the perspective of this young girl living in this apartment. Um, and it shows the way she, <laughs> initially resents the visitors as she imagines how much more fun they're probably having by sleeping on that little cot. They probably get the TV in the living room all to themselves. They can eat all the snacks they want, play all night long. And all of this while she is stuck in a small room next to her snoring sister. To me, this is a story about empathy and about growth. And I'm super excited to give you guys a preview of this book. We can now go to the next slide. I wanna tell you a little bit about how I fell in love with this story and the way I came to illustrate it. When I first read the manuscript by Hilda Eunice Burgos, I was super touched by the journey of growth 
this narrator goes through. And I was very excited because besides the beautiful message of community and compassion that everybody can relate to in this story, the story also highlights a Dominican family living in Washington Heights. And as some of you might know, the Dominican population in the New York City area is over 1 million. So I know that there's gonna be a big community that's gonna to relate to this book in a very special way. My decision to take this book on was extremely easy, not only because of everything that I've mentioned, but also because I've been wanting to venture into the world of picture books. And at that point, when, when the manuscript was presented to me, I would have been happy pretty much with anything. But the fact that this is such a special story makes me feel incredibly fortunate. And I can't tell you guys how grateful I am to the Coquilla team for taking a chance on me with this. Uh, being my first book, I didn't have a lot of sequential art in my portfolio. I'd been focusing mostly on editorial illustrations. So I know this was a big leap for them. And I'm super thankful that they trusted me and had the patience to guide me along the way. And not only that, but they allowed me to try out a new style. Because in my work, I usually depict people a little more realistically. And that requires a lot of reference for me. And with this book, I wanted to have more freedom and that I had the idea that it would be better to just do more stylized characters so I could work from my imagination. And they trusted me with that. So I'm super grateful. And now we can go to the next slide. I'm going to share a, a few images from the interior of the book now. And I just wanna give you a glimpse of the book and the narrator's journey. This young girl has a super active imagination and she creates elaborate stories in her mind of how the cut in the living room will be an endless source of fun for her. Here she is explaining this to her sister who doesn't take her very seriously. <laughs> Next. When Raquel arrives, she is so busy worrying about all the fantastic adventures this intruder is going to have playing dominoes with her dad that she fails to pay attention to the shy and scared girl waving goodbye to her father behind her. Next slide. Here, she ignores Edgardo, only to focus on how he will get all the snacks that she's not allowed to have in her room and how he will probably get crumbs all over the cot. Next. The narrator resents how much attention this boy is receiving from her mom. Next. And forgive my barking dog in the background. So one night, no one comes over and her dreams of having the cot all to herself finally come true. Next. But it's lonely and scary, unlike anything that she had imagined. Next. And now, when Raquel comes back, she starts paying attention. She finally sees how sad this girl looks and how she probably really misses her dad. Next. So she invites Raquel into her room and it's so much fun. Next. To conclude, I wanna tell you what I think of the story is about. I think that this is a story about a journey from judgment to compassion. It's about learning how the stories we create in our minds can prevent us from seeing things as they really are. Once the narrator can actually see the visitors for who they are, she develops an empathy and compassion that expands her own reality. Um, and I just think that this is something that we can apply to our lives on all levels. And I hope that it resonates with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabby. Next up, we are going to be hearing from Lauren Long. Lauren Long is one of the most iconic and beloved illustrators of our time. He has collaborated with authors ranging from Angela Johnson, Julie Fogliano, and Matt De La Pena to Barack Obama, Frank McCourt, and Madonna. 
His best-selling Otis the Tractor series is in development as an animated TV show, and one of his most recent picture books, Love by Matt De La Pena, is a number one New York Times bestseller. Lauren lives in Cincinnati with his wife, sons, and their pet Weimaraners. Take it away, Lauren. Okay, thank thank you so much. It's I'm I'm so honored and flattered to be here. Thank you for having me, um, Gabby. Beautiful, um, James, just beautiful. I'm I'm so happy to be here. Let me jump in. An architect creates a space. She'll draw, redraw, measure, and trace a woodsy, warm, and peaceful place. But Someone works to guide the saws, plane the logs, lead the team. Someone needs to pound the nails. Someone has to build the dream. And in Lisa Wheeler's Someone Builds the Dream, she goes on to write about a bridge, a fountain, a wind turbine, an amusement park, and a book, the very book you're holding in your hands. Um, and in the end there, there is a self-portrait of the illustrator and a portrait of the writer working on the very book that readers will be doing. And my dog, Charlie, my current dog, is a rescue hound dog barking at me on one of the last pages. Not unlike Gabby's dog was barking during her presentation. Uh, so just like Gabby, I'm an illustrator. Somebody else has written a text, and this is what it looks like when I first see it in my inbox. I immediately was drawn to this project. I wanted to make, the, I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to to add my pictures visually to tell Lisa Wheeler's story, um, for two reasons. It shines a much needed spotlight on the quiet heroes in our society who work hard every day in the skilled trades to make my life and our life better. So for me, there was a real strong empathy piece on this. It's the respect and dignity of all labor and all laborers. And then also, secondly, it just hit me square, squarely um, with my artistic influence sweet spot. I love the American art that was being done in America in the first half of the 20th century which included the Ashcan School, um, the American scene painters, the American regionalists, and a host of WPA muralists. Um, I felt like those WPA murals and those muralists had such a strong sense of pride and hope in what they were painting. Um, and it was during the depression in our country, during a really tough time. And it was a government funded initiative to get people to work. I just love that sense of pride and hope that that art showed on all those post offices and state buildings. And I wanted to put that into my art for someone builds the dream. One of my all time favorites is the artist Thomas Hart Benton. And uh, now these are uh, sections of a mural he painted called America Today. Actually, Benton was not a WPA muralist. He came a little bit, this painting, for example, was created in the 20s. The WPA movement, Works Progress Administration, didn't come along until mid to late 30s with FDR. But you can see Benton's influence in my work. Here's a couple of his landscapes. And then of course, Grant Wood, famously known for the American Gothic painting, but he had all of these rich, um, landscapes that were so unique and all you have to do is look at a, a lot of my books um specifically otis the tractor to see my in their influence on my work and fellow panelists please excuse that shameless plug so my process for making the book those guys were working in oil on canvases on and walls big i still work traditionally um which could change um stay tuned on that but um I start with a pencil sketch, just like most of us do. And you can see here, it, my, my name's on the book, but I'm working with a team. So I've got an art director and an editor. Here's just a quick rundown through my process. Sketches, we're trying to figure out a cover for 
we want it to be a, a heroic poster. So at first the team's looking at an unfinished book, looking at us. Then I decided, we decided that maybe they're looking at a finished bridge and it's a couple of figures. And then we thought, how about have this strong worker looking up at the bridge she had a part in creating. You can see me in my uh, high tech form, I've blown this up. The art director has laid, laid in the display type, which is the title treatment. So I have an idea when I go to work where that's gonna lay and then I just trace it down. It's like I did in seventh and eighth grade. Um, I'm glazing in, working with acrylics thinly at first and then building it up, transparent glazes. And you can see here on the left, I'm finishing up my, my majestic sky. I'm pretending I'm Benton and N.C. Wyeth and I'm, I'm trying to paint, paint the grand, you know, the grand scene here. And uh, painted the background first, laid my thing over, used carbon paper, traced down my figure, and I just painted her in. You see, I'm trying to handle the lighting that her body is shaded from, the, from her waist down, dark in shadow, so she pops off the background. And then I have a bad habit of over noodling my work. Um, I think it's better sometimes than under noodling, but that's an argument. But um, so I go in a lot of times with colored pencils and then you see the final painting there. And I just wanna wrap my section up with talking about something that's very important to me. And I'm very proud that's important to we, the picture book makers making literature for children. And that is how much representation matters, inclusion. I want children of all kinds that don't even look like me because when I was a father, I didn't have to think about that as much. I want children, all different kinds of children to see themselves in my books. Um, and someone builds a dream. Lisa Wheeler gave me an option, or a, a, she gave me an opportunity to not only show children what they could see in themselves, but they could see what they may become. And also I can imagine as I'm painting this paintings, I'm, I can imagine that the book is sitting there and a little child is, looks up and he says, that's my dad. That's my mom, that's my aunt, that's my grandparent. Maybe that's un my uncle on the pages of Someone Builds the Dream. Maybe it's a cousin or a neighbor. And most of all, I like people to look at my work, but I want them to see my work and I want them to feel my work. And I want children, when they look at Someone Builds the Dream, to see work, feel work, see effort, muscle, Sweat, I wanted them to actually see sweat. Precision, leadership, I wanted them to see artistry and teamwork. And most of all, wonder and most of all, pride. I wanted them to feel and see pride in the labor that is on the pages of Someone Builds the Dream. Thank you guys so much for letting me share. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, our final presenter today will be Karina Lucan. Karina makes art in the Pacific Northwest where she is inspired by small things like hearts, trees, and mistakes, and by big things like love, nature, and the web of relationships that connects us all. She is the author and illustrator of two previous picture books, my Heart, a New York Times bestseller, and The Book of Mistakes, and the illustrator of Adrian Simcox Does Not Have a Horse and Nothing in Common. Thank you so much for joining us, Karina. Hi, thank you everyone for having me. Um, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you and all of these other amazing illustrators and authors here. Um, so I'll, I'll jump right in here to, um, these are my books that were just mentioned and uh, the ones on the left, the three on the left I wrote and illustrated, the three on the right are ones that I'm the illustrator of. Uh, next. And the book I'm gonna talk about today is The Tree in Me. And this is the book in a maple tree in my front yard. Next. And so the, this book, The Tree in Me would probably not exist uh, without another book which is a book called Pieces Every Step. It's written by Thich Nhat Hanh. And in that book, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about a practice that he calls looking deeply. And this is a practice um, 
of looking at something. He talks about taking an orange or a table or an apple and looking at it and wondering where does this come from? And so as you eat the fruit, the idea is to, to, to realize that this fruit comes from a tree, which comes from the sun and it comes from rain and it comes from soil. Um, and that without all of those things, we would not have this fruit to eat. And the idea is it's a gratitude exercise. It's a mindfulness practice, kind of a, a meditation while you're eating. And so when I read this book in ninth grade, it changed the way I saw the world. Um, it changed a lot of things for me. And so I have always kind of wanted to take that idea, that practice, that imagination exercise and make a book about it. I've tried a few times and it's never been very good. Um, but the tree me is where I, I, I finally wrote something that I thought was worthy of this idea. So next. Um, so just like Thich Nhat Hanh talks about an orange or an apple, it, you can take this practice of looking deeply and you can apply it to anything. So for example, a paintbrush. And on the right there, you can see one of the paintbrushes I used to paint this book. And, um, and if you look at the paintbrush and you ask yourself, what is this made up of? You might see that the handle is wood and it came from a tree and there's metal, which came from the earth. There's plastic, which came from a factory. And so this paintbrush is actually part tree, uh, part mountain and part factory. And if you look a little more deeply and, and Lauren's book is just such a beautiful example of this. I'm so happy to follow right on, on the trails of that because if you look more deeply, you'll see the workers. You'll see the loggers who fell the trees. You'll see the miners in the factory. You will see the factory, or the miners in the mines, the factory workers. And without all of them, we would not have the paintbrush. And I would not have been able to make the tree in me. And you look more deeply still, you'll see the farmers who grew the food that fed these people. And you'll see their parents and their parents before them and their parents before them. And so we have this long line of people without whom uh, this paintbrush would not exist and my book would not exist. Next. And on top of that, there's all these other books. This is my library. These are my bookshelves alphabetized by illustrator. And these are all books that informed me that I have loved. Um, that, that taught me how to be a bookmaker. And without all of these books, the tree in me would not exist. Next. So I wanna tell you just a little bit about the process of making this book. I, um, I started, as you might imagine, with the color green. I was thinking about trees. This book started as a poem, um, but I quickly realized that it was becoming too literal. Next. And, um, and it was a combination of things. One, it was the green. And the other thing is that I had this story that was starting to emerge as I tried to add images to the book of a, of a single child with an apple and friends and a tart and a picnic in the sun and the shade. And it was all getting very literal. And I didn't, I didn't really want that. I didn't want this to be a book about one child and one tree. I wanted it to be more expansive. I wanted it to be more about you know, the tree of life and this idea of connection and of looking deeply. And so um, I switched from green. I started playing with other colors. I've always wanted to use neon pink. And when I started playing with pink, I realized that it brought something else, more of a layer of imagination to the book that was really serving the book better. Um, I also started playing with gouache. You can see in the beginning here, I have really clear lines, but it starts to feel like there's this real division between the child and their environment. Next. And I didn't want that. I wanted there to be more of a sense of connection and of interconnection and blurring boundaries between the human being and the world that they live in and everything that is part of them and, and how we are all part of each other. So here's some experiments. I make a lot of experiments, a lot of, um, I, I give myself permission to make art I don't even like in order to find my way into a story. Um, next. But you'll see that eventually what I started doing is taking gouache and layering over the ink and trying to create layers of texture and color to sort of soften these boundaries between the child and their world. And so here's one example of that title page and how it sort of started to evolve. Next. Uh, some more examples of me playing around and experimenting with how to create more of a, a feeling of interconnection between the child and their environment um, or the children. Next. And finally, I landed on kind of the look that is the look of the book. And you can see here that I start with ink, I add gouache, I draw into it when it's still wet with a pencil to create texture and then layer back over that with ink and more gouache and more layers to try to create this transparency, but also this sense of connection and of inter interconnection. Next. 
Um, so that's the final look of the book there. Next. And one other thing I want to say about pink and trees. I love trees. I love drawing them. They're in a lot of my books. But the pink in this tree is partly also inspired by another tree in another book from the Book of Mistakes. Next. When I show this book in classrooms to kids, I often show them these process pictures and talk about how the book used to end with the tree. And um, it was actually a pink tree. And when I show these images, the kids gasp. They love this tree. And I often get asked, as often by boys as by girls, why I didn't keep the pink tree in the book. And I tell them that I there are, there are reasons why I couldn't and it wasn't working for the story. Um, next. But I've always had that in the back of my mind. So when I wanted to make this book, I really wanted it to have pink because I think there is something about the color pink in our culture. We, we limit it, you know, we have gender uh, restraints around that color. And um, so it really was important to me that I have a child who was not clearly a boy or a girl, but was just a child in nature that was allowed to enjoy and to just celebrate this explosion of pink and this sense of wonder and connection. So next. Uh, that's the final look of the book, the case cover there, and next. Uh, finally, if you want to hear more about the process of making that book, I did do an interview recently on this blog, whattoreadtoyourkids.com. So a little more information about it there if you're interested. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Karina. And we're now going to actually move to the Q&A portion of our webinar. So I invite all of our panelists to turn their cameras back on and unmute themselves, and we can get started. I'll do that too. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for that insight into all of your processes. And I'm excited to dig a little bit more into all of this with you. Um, I think we're actually going to start out just kind of with a, an introductory question for all of you. So, and then we'll move into kind of a more panel style free for all type thing. And we are getting quite a few questions from the audience. So um, if we've got time, we'll throw some of those in there as well for you. Um, but I think we're just gonna start off in presentation order. So James, I think we'll open up with you if that works for you. Um, sure. <laughs> Yeah, but I wanted to dig in a little more to some of what you were talking about. Um, you touched on some of this in your presentation, but I know also in your author's note for the book, um, you mentioned all of the different materials that Isamu Noguchi used in his art um, and how he just had different possibilities in all of them. And you talk about, you talked in your presentation about how because he had a Japanese father, an American mother, um, Japanese children considered him American and American children thought of him as Japanese. Um, and I'd love it if you could speak a little more to how you approach this idea of something just being more than one thing um, and, and talk about why you chose the second person text. You, you know, um, part of the more than one thing is, and, and this is something that I think a lot, a lot of kids do, not just Asian Americans or Asamu, but Asano had a hard, hard time trying to find a place, of, a sense of home, if that makes sense. You know, he didn't feel at home in either place. So a lot of times he's looking at material and he's thinking of how can he shape this in a way to make his own sense of home. And uh, I didn't show this in my presentation, but in the final sense, all the little materials he collects sort of turns into this dream thing at night where it kind of grows into his own garden, his own place in a lot of worlds. And, and, and this is true to his home in his real life. When you look at his gardens, he even mentions it was a sense to create an environment that was his, where he, he could feel like this is a place where he was centered. So that connected a lot to me also, which is why I looked at a lot of things that are metaphors. You look at his, you look at his sculptures, you look at his furniture and, and his shapes, a lot of it is, um, it's an appreciation. Like he uses the shapes inherently for to enhance it to be what it could be in, in his vision or in, in his world so there's a lot of that and i and like all our the other artists here we all have a different way of seeing things so that's you know we see the world we order it in a sense that uh, makes sense to us and that's how we create pictures one of my friends he's, he's a legendary illustrator Henrik Drescher, says that every artist basically has one or two sort of architectures in their head and then we spend our lives building things on those architectures. And it's one of the deepest things I've ever heard and it kind of makes sense. You know, maybe we, I think it's a wonderful metaphor. So that's part of that story there when you see Isamu. The reason why for the second person is I sort of naturally 
for some reason that connects to me like once upon a time. You know, my editor had seen my Golf Digest story and uh, I started it out, if, if you're an illustrator in New York and they ask you to go to the net masters, the proper answer is yes. And then my editor told me like, no, James, you actually know how to write. So you're gonna do more writing on this book. And then she had me read uh, The Iridescence of Birds by, written by Patricia McLaughlin. And she starts out, you, you know, if you're Henri Matisse, you live in a, you live in a dreary, dreary um, village in France. And almost when I started there, I was like, I know how to write this book. So, you know, if you are in Samu with your mom, but it's almost like once upon a time in a setting, but it, it lets you read or know that like, imagine you're that person. And, and I think it also helps with the concept of what's next. You know, like, okay, if I'm on that person, what's the next page kind of happen? And there's something about that tone that I feel like invites the reader in more. Uh, well, and I wanted to mention to you too, that if you haven't seen it, you're getting some messages in the Q&A from people who are saying that uh, the message of this book really resonates with their own childhood experiences. So, well, you know, what, that's, that's, that's a very good feeling. because I feel like all kids have those moments. And, you know, it's not just me, but if you think about your childhood, we all have moments of quiet, hopefully. Great. Well, uh, Gabby, we're going to move on to you next. Um, and I... Oh, I, as you kind of showed us in your in some of your clips from the book, uh, the main character of the cot in the living room has such a vivid imagination. Um, you just showed us kind of this explosion of images from her mind, whether she's envisioning games she might play or these monsters that she thinks she sees when she finally gets a chance to sleep in the living room. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about how you kind of developed this motif and how you got inside of your head while working on, on this art. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. Um, I think that the author, Ilda, already, um, through her words, she showed that the narrator had this imagination. And I just try to build on that. So, for example, when the narrator says, oh, Papi never lets me build with the good dominoes, or this kid is going to get crumbs all over the cot, she's already doing that. She's already creating a story in her mind. And I just try to, to complement those words with my work. And, and add to that a little bit more, just keep building on it and think, okay, how can I push this? How can I um, just take these words as a point of departure and create my own, my own story uh, that helps illustrate what this would look like in this child's mind. And I hope that I, that I was able to achieve that. You have a couple questions here in the Q and A. Um, there's some Washington Heights natives who are really excited to uh, to see their neighborhood represented in picture books. And then you have a couple of questions too um, for people who are wondering, since this is your first picture book, they're wondering what the experience has been like for you to kind of get your feet wet in picture book illustrating. I have absolutely loved it. Um, it's just such a wonderful world. I mean. I'm, I'm just very excited and honored and um, I don't even know <laughs> where to begin, but it's, <laughs> it's basically, I, it, this book is opening up a new world for me and, um, and because I didn't have, like I said in my talk, I'm just grateful because I know that I didn't, I didn't have examples of sequential art in my portfolio and things like this and now this is beginning to show, okay, here's what I can start to do and hopefully keep building on this and learning more. And, and I'm really hopeful that I can keep creating more books in the future and maybe my own stories too, like that I can write and illustrate. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren, you're up next. And we want to hear, so the primary focus of Someone Builds a Dream, as you showed us, is on these people in trade industries who works, whose work supports creative endeavors. Um, and as you are somebody who obviously works primarily in a creative field, can you just tell us how you thought through, I mean, you've done this a lot already, but can you tell us a little more about how you thought through the illustrations for this book, um, especially initially when you first received the manuscript? Yeah, thank you. Um... Um, thank you, Maggie. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, one of the fortunate, that, yeah, I've been doing this for a while, and I can genuinely, I can genuinely 
say, I, I, like, welcome, Gabby, because I, it wasn't that long ago, I remember doing my first book, and I remember thinking, man, if they would just have me, I wonder if I could just make a living doing, telling stories and making pictures um, for kids, and and I never thought I would write anything at first, Gabby. And, um, you know, and then along came, you know, little tractor and shameless plug, sorry. Um, but, um, but, I, but I will say, um, I, I sat down with Lisa, Maggie, and um, was able to pick her brain, the author, Lisa Wheeler of Someone Builds a Dream. And she just was very open with me. And she said, she talk, told me about her blue collar background. Um, Blue collar, white collar, right? We have, our, our society is so quick to to separate everyone and give them a label. And um, and Lisa said, "I'm a blue collar writer," and and I immediately loved her. And it was like um, we're different people living in different places. But I was just like, you know, that's how I feel as an illustrator, man. I'm going in my studio every morning. There's a bigger chance I'm going to fail than succeed. It's crazy. I'm going to make pictures and then somebody's somebody's going to take my pictures and shine them in such a beautiful spotlight, add beautiful uh, design touches to them. And I'm, I get to work with a really intelligent editor and an even, you know, an, an intelligent art director that are way better designers than me. And it's a real blessing. So for me to answer your question, it's an easy one. I, I can genuinely say that even though my name's on the cover of all my books, I truly don't feel like I'm any more important than that editor and designer and um, the person who typesets my books, the person who loads the reams into the printing press, the person who color checks proofs, the person who binds my book. These are people that are, that are, that are are not celebrated they're not um seen in the in the world and somebody loads our books into boxes and then loads them onto a truck or a or a ship and drives them to independent bookstores and so i feel like it is a big team kind of like what corinna was saying with that that paintbrush it's there's so much that went behind that and that's what i loved about this text and that's why i wanted to to make the pictures and have be a part of that forever. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And then, Karina, I it, just in both text and illustration, this is such a meditative picture book. Um, and I know a lot of a lot of teachers and educators these days are talking about the importance of social emotional learning, and especially as we're going through this this pandemic and like trauma recovery is just such at the forefront of what a lot of kids are talking about. Um, so I'm wondering what you hope children who who read this book or read this book are what you hope they'll take away from it. Yeah, um, I think you know, for me, first and foremost, when I make a book, I I um, I'm trying to make an experience and and kind of a space in the world for for the reader to have an experience that they might not have another way. And I think of it a little bit. I mean, I I love poetry, and so when I make picture books, I think you know they are such a platform for poetry, but they're also really special in that they are meant to be shared and they're meant to be read aloud. Poetry is meant to be read aloud too, but I think so often we don't. But like picture books, almost almost are guaranteed that more than half the time they're read are gonna, they're gonna be read out loud. And so I think of like some of my favorite poets when I think, when I make picture books and I think about the way I feel after I've read a poem that's really moved me and I kind of take a breath and there's this pause. And, and so, you know, with my books, I'm, I'm trying to kind of do that. And so with the tree in me in particular, I think of it as like um, an invitation for two things, you know, um, an invitation for celebration and, um, or I, mean, I think of it as an invitation and a celebration. So the celebration part is kind of like celebrating kids and their perspective. Cause I think this idea of looking deeply is something they do naturally and well, and like just being imaginative is something they do well. Um, and grownups, we move away from that sometimes. And so my hope, like the book is told from a kid's perspective and in the end it's shared with an adult and my, my hope is that in some way it might create an opportunity as adults for us to, 
to um, connect with the kid that's reading the book in a slightly different way. And I, I think a little bit about myself as a parent with my daughter getting older and how much less we do of that imagination stuff and how much harder it is for me to do some of that than it is for her. And I really trust that kids are smarter than we give them credit for and a little better at, um, at taking these leaps of imagination and of like taking something that might not like, is there really a tree in me? And I, I don't think that's a problem for the child mind to kind of understand that. Um, so I do think of the book as a meditation, but I think, you know, if we don't want to use the word meditation, we can talk about it as an imagination, uh, an invitation to imagine. Well, I'd love to hear about all of your processes um, when it comes to collaborating with authors. Uh, for Kim and Karina, I know in this case, you, you illustrated your own text, but I you have worked with authors in the past. Um, and then Lauren and Gabby, um, and you started to talk about it a little bit, you both worked with writers on these books. Um, obviously Lauren, you and your author made a cameo in this book. Um, and it's just, it's interesting to see how all the different pieces of the books and the arts fit together. And you showed us pieces of them. Um, there are just some really, really interesting repeating elements in Someone Builds the Dream. Lauren, I love how you use white space, especially in, in your book to kind of layer these elements that kind of mirror the repeating elements of the text. Um, Gabby in the cotton in the living room, there's so much that's inferred to the text or that's happening in the bathroom and a lot of that comes through in the art. So it'd be great, especially if you could both just tell us a little bit more about the process of illustrating someone else's words and, and what made you excited about these books in particular. And then Karina and James, feel free to weigh in uh, as well. I know mean, you've, you've had these experiences in the past. I'll let you go first, Lauren. <laughs> How dare you? Okay. Okay. Gabby. Um, and I'll be quick. Um, Cause I kind of have already told, you know, I, when I talk about books that I'm illustrating, I, I start getting passionate and um, speeding up and, you know, and getting, you know, demonstrative, but so you already kind of know why I love th that empathy piece for me and shining a spotlight on, on people that are out there working really hard Um in all the different trades and the dignity of labor and how um, uh, you, you know, some of our children are gonna go to college and become an engineer and someday design a bridge. Um, but there may be another of our children that goes to a trade school and learns how to weld and, and welds parts of that bridge. And my hope for all of my re of, of readers and our children is, is that they, respectively uh, understand their own uh, and, and admire and respect each other's important role in that bridge. Um, Lisa's text, sometimes I'll look at a text, um, whether I've written it or somebody else has written it, and I break it up in moments that I want to portray, like I'm a film director breaking up a screen play, right? And and someone builds a dream there, she had a certain cadence. So she went from the bridge to, um, uh, to the fountain, to the wind turbine, et cetera, et cetera. So she had already created these breaks and it helped me break up the text and it helped that. So they call that pagination. So I had that pagination sort of already there. And so that white space that you mentioned was kind of a built-in in it. It was sort of like a stop for me in a, and to build a cadence. So a stop, there's um, white space, and then there's a really involved mural-esque picture, and then there's the final result, and then there's that stop and white space and so on and so forth. So yeah, it was a really fun um, picture book to work on. Chalk filled with figures, you know, Gabby mentioned <laughs> you know, drawing the human figure is hard and I'm, I'm basically a realist, but I'm sort of a stylized realist. So yeah, I didn't use photo reference for all those figures, but I'm kind of making them up kind of like Corinna does and Gabby, you did out of your head and same with James. So I'm a realist enough that it's hard, um, but you know, I'm always going back and forth between Am I too stylized? Am I not stylized? Oh, and then I look at, you know, all these other artists. And I'm like, oh, man, they're so good. And, you know, so anyway, thank you. 
Wow. <laughs> I agree with a lot of what you said, Lauren. And um, for me in particular, um, to respond to your question, Maggie, about how it was collaborating with an author, in this case with Ilda in particular, um, I, as I said before, I was building on her words. So I was trying to take what she had there already, which was beautiful and imaginative and bring a bit more of my imagination into it in a way that just complemented what she already said um, and didn't take anything away from it. And when I first read it, I, I thought, well, I have the option of doing this in a very literal way. So when the character is saying like, oh, this girl comes over tonight and she's gonna get to play with the dominoes. I could have drawn literally that girl coming into the room and, and her just having like a, an upset face. But I wanted to add a little bit more fantasy to it um, to just have um, something that gave kids an, an opportunity to actually bring, make their, their own imaginations go further and maybe keep building on what I added to Ilda's words and, and so on. Um, so yeah, that was my, my, my experience collaborating. And to respond, you're part of the question about what made me take on this project in particular. I touched on that uh, during the presentation, but yeah, besides it being just a beautiful story of community and compassion, um, which I think are such important themes that we must apply to, to our lives and that are gonna bring joy to, to us because we're uh, social animals basically. So I think if we start, uh, seeing people for who they are and, and, and having compassion that is gonna make us all so much happier. Uh, and I, so I just love that message in particular. And, and then going into like a, a more zoomed in level, being from the Dominican Republic myself, not, uh, ori I'm originally from the DR. I do live in New York City now, but uh, I grew up in the Dominican Republic and everything. And even though I, I I didn't, I don't have the experience of having grown up in Washington Heights. Um, I'm also someone who was used to seeing how there's so much community uh, in our, um, just in our people from the Dominican Republic. Like uh, I used to stay over with my neighbors all the time myself when I was little. And I think that uh, highlight, highlighting those qualities is just a beautiful thing. And I was excited to collaborate uh, in that sense. And finally, uh, going in a little bit deeper, even um, just what Lauren said about representation matters, that is also one of the other reasons why I really wanted to do this. I really, there's not a lot of stories about Dominican families, about Black families, about, um, yeah, like so many of these things that, that um, I think Coquila is so beautifully bringing uh, forward with with the books that they're publishing and I was just very honored to join their family and and try to um, give my little grain of salt gr grain of sand I mean <laughs> to this beach of of beautiful stories thank you so much and then Karina and James we'd love to hear about it from the other end too just tell us about your approach to illustrating your own text and how much did the art influence the text or the other way around um, you want to go first, Karina, or? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so for me, every book is a little different. Like with uh, the Book of Mistakes, I had like the first couple lines and then very quickly the pictures came into my head and then there was this back and forth building um, because drawing was such an important part of that book. That just kind of is how the, the story evolved. But with My Heart and with The Tree in Me, they both started as a poem. So my books can go either way. Um, I've, I've always loved to write as, and I love, I've always loved to draw. And so I, I love illustrating other people's books because it gives me a chance often to work, work on the kinds of projects I would never write. Like there is not the way I write because when I write it is more like a poem. Um, and I love that. And I also love doing my own projects where I have complete control over you know, them both. And, and what I really love is the way that when I add art, I can I can adjust the words, I can cut things out. I can say the art is doing this well, the words don't need to do this anymore and I can remove them. Um, and that's a really fun game for me. It's a really fun of like how, 
how simple can I get this? How simple can the words be? Can I just cut them down even more? Um, can't usually do that with a writer that you're working with. It's hard to be like, could you just cut out, you know, this whole paragraph? And um, which is also a great thing because when you are in charge of the words, you never know when you're going to like. There's there's not a like clear like it's done. You can stop now. You've done everything. You're always kind of questioning like. And up to the very, very end, you could change the words, which can also make it sort of unwieldy and, and more difficult um, at times. So, you know, it goes either way. I would, an example from the tree in me of that process though, where I start with a poem and add pictures, um, I really was starting to add the art and I was starting to get the story about this, you know, single kid picking an apple, eating it, having the picnic with friends. And um, I had these lines, you know, the tree in me is part apple, part orange pear, almond plum, part shade and part sun. And I really liked the rhythm of that and then it went on. But as I started to draw, I was like, oh, they're eating this, they're gonna eat this tart. And, and the word yum came into my mind. I was like, oh, yum could, could fit in there. And so there was a lot of back and forth. Does the yum belong? Does it break up the rhythm too much? Or is it adding something? And eventually because of the art, I inserted the spread that says part yum and shows the kids eating. And so that was fully the art adding, the art changing the words. Um, so it's, for me, it's a back and forth dance and that's one example. Uh, for, uh, for me, I, my career started out at, mainly as an illustrator, so I'm very visual. So normally with my stories, I think of them pictorially first. Can I tell the story visually? And with my earlier books, the words come later. And honestly, I leaned a lot on my editor, Tracy Gates, and Jim, who were like, they're my dream collaboration team. So I'm encouraging them to constantly have a healthy lifestyle and outlive me so I can keep working with them. Um, so, and then, but I have gotten better. I'm sure the other people feel the same. I've gotten better at the writing part. So now it's more, is there a story I want to tell? I'm a little bit, just in a very small way, like Tarantino, like I'm sort of a fan, instead of like a fan of all these movies, I'm a fan of a lot of children's books. So I'm always wanting to do like, oh, I want to do my version of Drummer Hoff, or I want to do, uh, in the case of this time, I've always wanted to do my um, Snowy Day. And I was looking, I just didn't, honestly, I didn't have the emotional depth as a writer or storyteller I felt until recently to be able to feel op open and vulnerable enough to have my version, like Isamu's story kind of resonates enough with me. And then I realized it was like, oh, wow, I can kind of do my version of that and misremember it even and if you look, look through this book, it's got a little bit of homages to, and it's subconscious, okay? But there's like homages to like um, Harold, uh, uh, was it uh, Harold's purple crayon? You know, definitely snowy day, a little bit of, um, you know, the forest metaphor could be from where the wild things are. The, you know, so I'm, I'm a fan of children's books. That's where it comes from. But, uh, you know, like um, I started writing more now. So writing, I'm now starting to figure out like what kind of books I feel like connect with kids. I, it's like, I, I want to do a book that I would want to read as a kid, maybe who didn't have anything to do on a slow day and I want to be taken to another world. So that's kind of how I choose my stories. And then when it comes to like, I don't do this. Oh, the other reason, which I'm sure helps too, is like it's easier to draw if you write your own words because you know how you think compositionally. You know, I think that makes it easier sometimes. So some of the stories I do not take from other authors, it's, it's not because I don't like the story, I just don't feel like I can see architecturally the way that their story is being told. Like I could probably think of two or three other illustrators who do it better, if that makes sense. But if it's a chance where like, occasionally there's stories or books that I wanna do, and it's like, I wanna do it, but I don't wanna do it in my voice, if that makes sense. You know, I feel like somebody can tell it better. And like, when I get those, I jump on those in a heartbeat, because it's like, this is the kind of book that will make both of us happy. And they told the story in a way that um, I could not do. You know, this is, this, this is a very happy thing. So that's personally how I choose stories in that matter. I, I hope that made sense. <laughs> Thank you so much. And unfortunately, we're actually out of time. So we're going to have to wrap up. Um, I just wanted to read you one not so much a cue, but a comment from the Q&A, which is from Becky, who says, I just wanted to compliment all the authors and thank them for sharing their work. Everything is so beautiful and they should be very proud. I can't wait to read all of these books. Thank you so much. So we'll close on that. And thank you again for participating in uh, this, this panel today.
um, and just for, for sharing your processes. It's been great to have you all. Thank you. Um, tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. If you haven't already, be sure to check out Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post about all things books and library land. If you're not yet a subscriber, pair the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. While you're perusing Booklist online, be sure to check out Booklinks, a quarterly supplement to Booklist, perfect for educators and school librarians. It is now freely available to all. To start reading, type booklinks.booklistonline.com into your web browser. Did you know registration for ALA's virtual annual conference and exhibition is now open? Taking place between June 23rd and 29th, this year's conference will feature amazing speakers, educational programming, and an opportunity to connect with colleagues and librarians everywhere. Plus, if you register before April 16th, you'll save on registration rates. Visit https backslash backslash 2021.alaannual.org. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar and one more huge thank you to our sponsor, Penguin Young Readers. This concludes today's webinar.